Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We will just be filling out the virtual room. So I'm just going to wait a minute or two for that to do for that to happen, maybe another 30 seconds. I can see the numbers totting up uh, as I speak. So that's excellent. I'll just give it another 10 seconds and then, and then we'll get going because we've got plenty to get through this afternoon. Okay, welcome uh, to this uh, electric vehicle forum um, hosted by uh, Regen uh, on the question of how can local authorities help enable the electric vehicle uh, revolution? Thank you for uh, taking the time out to join us today. Um, um, we've got a really wide range of, of, of hopefully really good speakers. <laughs> uh, I know they're good speakers already, but uh, really good content to get through. And obviously uh, the subject we're, we're talking about today is, is very a, a live one, um, considering the uh, announcements yesterday um, on the de transport decarbonisation plan. Um, as well as um, the transport uh, to zero emissions cars and vans 2035 delivery plan, the smart charging consultation response. So I'm sure all of you have been busy uh, burying your heads in, in, in all those pages of, of content and, and policy documents. So um, uh, we will we, we kind of unpicking some of the, the key aspects for local authorities uh, throughout today, hopefully. So um, that's uh, just to introduce that. So. Quick introduction to myself. Um, so my name is Ollie Franklin. I am electric vehicle and innovation lead at Regen. Um, and if we just switch to the next slide, Hannah, that'd be ideal. So Regen, we are an independent not-for-profit um, center of energy um, um, expertise and market insight, uh, and we kind of work across a whole range of different technologies, um, not just uh, zero carbon transport, which is the main focus of today. Um, we, we try and cover the kind of heat and build environment, uh, as well as electricity storage, flexibility. Um, and we, are, we work with a whole range of different clients, in, including local authorities uh, and network operators in particular. We do have a membership, uh, which I'm on the side. So um, my colleagues might might drop a, a, a link to that in, on the, um, in the chat. Um, but um, so we have a region membership. We also have the electricity storage network where we kind of look at um, the some of the kind of challenges around electricity storage uh, and markets and revenues and, and other aspects in more detail. Um, so that's that's quite a quite a good kind of one of the leading trade bodies in, in that area. So there's more information on that um, in the chat. And finally, we have the kind of Women in Ruben Energy Network, um, which is an opportunity for um, those in the sector to network and have a kind of mentoring opportunity there as well. So you can either be a mentee or a mentor, um, and there's plenty to get you to grips within that in terms of different events as well. I'll just go to the next slide. So one of the key aspects of our work over the last several years now, actually, um, has been uh, the distribution future energy scenarios work. So this is where we take the national grid uh, future energy scenario framework, and we try and really embed it in, in a more local approach and, and look at local evidence and um, local resource uh, uh, for certain technologies and local baselines um, where we're seeing kind of pockets of, of kind of strong growth in certain technologies already. And this covers all technologies, including electric vehicles, um, and we've got a whole kind of different subcategories of the different electric vehicle types and charging infrastructure types within that, which is why I'm highlighting it today. But it's not just electric vehicles, it's uh, heat pumps, um, it's, it's battery storage, it's solar, um, it's a whole, whole range of different demand and generation technologies that are going to be coming on the system um, over the next few years or, or are already on the system. Um, but it, the, the main purpose of the, the, the distribution future energy scenarios work is to really inform that investment and, and network planning that the network, network operators are in, in the process of doing. So do they need to reinforce the network, build bit of, bigger substations or bigger supergrid transformers in certain areas? Or do they need to um, do local flexibility tenders to kind of 
and try and, and deal with these kind of new peaks in demand um, that are going to be coming through. So there's been lots of consultation sessions over the last few weeks. So hopefully many of you have been involved in that, but there's, there's, there's some further information in that link again, which I, I think one of my colleagues might just jump in the chat. Um, so please do uh, have a look at that because that's a really interesting area of work. Just moving on to the agenda. So we have a very full agenda today, um, as I mentioned uh, up front. Um, and yeah, thank you for everyone that's been using the chat so uh, um, already, so you can introduce yourself in the chat. Um, we've got plenty of people online, so um, please do use the, the chat for that. It's kind of a discussion board, um, share some kind of relevant uh, links to any reports or documents that you've been working on. Um, we're very keen to kind of share views, best practice, uh, and, and particularly around the role of local authorities in this electric vehicle revolution. That's the whole, whole point of today. So please do use the chat function. Um, we'll also uh, be using the Q&A function again, so that's on the, the bottom of your, your of your screen on the bottom bar. So if you have any specific questions you'd like to ask um, our speakers, then um, just use that and I'll be monitoring that as, as chair um, to try and, and make sure that we, we cover uh, cover cover those off as, as much as we possibly can. And we do have plenty of time in the agenda for discussion today. So um, we've got a whole set of speakers that are in front of you um, on the agenda today and also a kind of a fair amount of time for discussion in the panel session later on. So just going through the agenda then, um, just giving you a, a kind of quick rundown of that before we get going. So I've done the introduction and then we'll be moving on from Emily um, from Ozev to give us a kind of Kind of a quick overview of what's going on from an OZEV point of view in terms of policy and support mechanisms. We will then turn to a couple of case studies from Tom and Lizzie um, in terms of what what's going on on the, kind of on the ground and kind of sharing some best practice uh, from a local authority angle. We will then move on to Richard uh, from the NHC Saving Trust, who will talk about some of the support that's already available for local authorities and from them. And as I mentioned, so the rest of the time is really dedicated to the panel discussion. So we'll we'll try and unpick some of the issues there. So yeah, as I mentioned, do use the Q and A function to uh, put 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 your thoughts across, and um, remember to uprate your questions that you're particularly interested in getting answered. So. Um, there's an uprate function once we start get questions um, popping up into that Q&A function. So uh, please uh, do do that. I think we'll start uh, with a very quick poll. Um, so my colleague will just pop that up on the screen magically. Um, so we'll be, we've got a couple of polls planned um, to try and get, get your interaction as an audience. Um, so this is, this is the first one, obviously from a local authority perspective, because that's the, the focus of today. Um, uh, but it'd be, if you're not a lo local authority, um, I'm just interested to see your views on that as well. So uh, obviously, um, electric vehicle strategies are a crucial aspect of local authority work at the moment. And, and many uh, local authorities are in, in the process or have already uh, delivered um, an EV strategy to, in, in some form. So we're just looking to get a kind of feeling of, of those in the room of where everyone's at. Um, so it looks like um, we're getting kind of no, but it's in development is that seems to be the most popular choice there at 51% um, and no, not yet. Uh, it's the kind of next most popular. And so a relatively few number of, of yes, um, and yes, we're delivering the action plan. So that, that's useful to know. So the, 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 that's the point of today is really to share share what's already been done, share best practice, because um, so many of the challenges that local authorities are facing are, are, are shared. Um, so that's brilliant. Thank you for those votes. Okay, without further ado, I think we'll get cracking into the agenda. Um, so I will hand over to Emily from OZEV, who will just give us a rundown of some of the latest work they've been up to. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ollie. Um, yeah, so as Ollie said, my name is Emily Sam. I'm one of the deputy heads at the Office for Zero Emissions Vehicles. Um, and my remit covers the EV infrastructure strategy. So this is our longer term um, plans for rollout of EV charging infrastructure across the country. 
and also for consumer experience. So what happens when a driver turns up to a charge point right now? Can they find a charge point? Does it work, et cetera? So I'm going to talk today, give a brief overview as to work that government's doing at the moment to support that transition. Um, and to, in at the end of the presentation, talking in a bit more detail about work in supporting local authorities. You may notice when I'm doing this that the slides were prepared before yesterday's package was announced. So obviously wasn't couldn't quite guarantee that, that exactly when they would come out. So there will be some bits where the slides look slightly out of date, but hopefully I can cover that whilst I'm actually talking. But just to be aware of when you refer back to them later. Um, so can I have the next slide, please? Um, this diagram is just for anyone who doesn't know us to explain a bit more about who OZEV are. We're a joint government unit. We sit between the Department for Transport and the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. So we pull together both the transport side of the EV transition, but also the hubs that connect into the energy systems. And we work very closely with um, colleagues in Bayes, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, on the auto side. So making sure vehicles are ready as well. Now for the next slide as well, please. And now just some context, which I'm sure you're all very well aware of. Um, in 2019, UK legislated for net zero greenhouse gas emissions across its economy. And our role in OZEB is to ensure that the EV transition is there to in support that process. And this is obviously about benefiting human health by reducing air pollution as well as noise, but also bringing about the significant economic opportunities there are for the UK, both nationally and at a local level. And next slide, please. So the two uh, crucial announcements that came out at the end of um, last year were from the Prime Minister, the phase out date for new petrol and diesel cars and vans will be 2030, and that from 2035, all new cars and vans must be zero emissions at the tailpipe. By 2050, we want to ensure that almost all cars and vans are on the road to be zero emission. So since that announcement, we've been increasing, well not increasing, but we've been um, ensuring that there are a range of measures to enable that process to happen. And, we'll, and that's what I'm going to cover next. So can we move on to the next slide, please? So this is where my slides slightly start to fall out of date. Um, we said in November that we would consult further on the idea that from 2030, any new cars and vans sold that can emit tailpipe emissions must deliver significant zero emission capability, for example, plug-in and bullet hybrids. Yesterday in that suite of documents that came out, which I'm sure you've all read cover to cover by now, um, one of them was a green paper on, I have to read this because it's a long title, a new road uh, vehicle CO2 emissions regulatory framework for the UK. And the important thing is about that document that it's seeking a definition of significant zero emission capability. So what is it that we actually mean by that phrase? We're very much focusing on the outcome here. So zero emission capability rather than on specific types of technology. So we do see an ongoing role for some full and plugging hybrids in the near term as part of that smooth transition. Alongside that consultation, we also published one on the phase out timings, sorry, <coughs> for HDV vehicles, which is obviously at an earlier stage of the process, but will be an important um, part of the wider transition. Can I have, can you jump two slides forward, please? And the next one. Thank you very much. So what are we doing to actually help do this? Well, we, into, on the vehicle side, which I'll do very quickly because um, probably less of direct impact for you, is um, we've been introducing grants obviously over a number of years to support vehicle uptake. So we have up to 582 million worth of grants available for those buying new zero and ultra low emissions vehicles. And that's both across cars, vans, trucks, taxis and motorbikes. There's also separate funding for bus funding and we offer a zero road tax for zero emission vehicles. And there's a company car tax benefit. So there's a range of measures on the fiscal side and then I'm sure you're aware that on the non-financial measure side, we also have a consumer awareness campaign and hopefully you'll have spotted new green number plates going around locally, which um, to highlight uh, the rollout. And we have in new skills and standards measures for dealerships and vehicle technicians. And we have increasing work in terms of the secondhand market uptake, which we see is particularly important for ensuring a level transfer, um, a transition rather. And clearly these measures are having significant impact already. So in 2019, only 3.1% of cars registered in the UK had a plug. It's now one in seven already this year. 
we go to the next slide, please. On the infrastructure side, which obviously has to accompany that rollout on the vehicle side, last year we announced 1.3 billion worth of investment in new infrastructure. 950 million of that is focused on future-proofing grid capacity along the motorways and key A roads, so very much the spine of this um, public network. But there is also 275 million for installation at homes, workplaces and on-street locations, which I will talk about a bit in a moment. And 90 million for a new local EV charging infrastructure fund, which we're setting up now, which will support the rollout of larger on-street charging schemes and rapid hubs in England. And clearly we think that there is a crucial role for local authorities and local approaches in this rollout, as you have seen in the transport decarbonisation plan. At the heart of our um, transition, we're seeing um, strong emphasis on local place-based approaches across transport and EVs in particular. We'll discuss, I'll discuss that again further later. Sorry, got a cold today. Can you have the next slide, please? <coughs> Accompanying that, we are introducing new regulations on building size to require all new homes to have an EV charge point, as well as non-residential properties, which are more than 10 parking spaces. So we want to ensure that as much as possible, we maximise the benefits that can be had from home charging um, for those with access to it and ensuring that all new homes provide that wherever they can. We're also um, requiring all home charge points to be smart to maximise both benefits to the end user, but also the system, the electricity system in terms of balancing the system. And we um, published a government response on smart charging yesterday as part of that package as well. And many of you will have seen and engaged in our work to improve the consumer experience of charge points so that people using the public network can do so reliably and pay easily and have um, open access to um, data where they need it for new technologies emerging. Next slide, please. So finally, the bit I wanted to focus on today is the role of local government. So what is it that we see as being the role of local government in this space? I mentioned before that we think that local authorities and local government generally have a crucial role in supporting EV charging infrastructure. So a number of places are doing this already at um, full speed and some really interesting and innovative work is coming out. But as just illustrated by that poll, we know that this is a particularly difficult area for many other areas. And the uptake is um, has a huge range across the country, both in terms of actual rollout of infrastructure, but also in terms of uptake of EVs themselves. So the two maps on the uh, slide illustrate the numbers of public charging devices per 100,000 of the population. Map one is just all public charging points and map two focuses particularly on the public rapid side. And as you'll see, and I'm sure aware of already, there are pockets of the country where that rollout has gone, um, where that rollout is higher than in other areas and, then, and that's part in terms of local needs. But it, it may also be about local other, other challenges that local areas are facing and some of those complexities about actually identifying what is needed locally and the best way of taking it forward. So we're introducing a number of measures to support local government in this role. Um, we already have the existing 20 million for on-street residential charge point scheme, which provides LAs with up to 75% of funding to install EV infrastructure on street and in public car parks. We have committed to supporting on-street charge points until at least 24, 25. And earlier this year, we amended the scheme to tackle a number of issues that we are aware of um, for local authorities. Sorry. One, to address prohibitively high electrical connection costs by increasing the maximum funding available per charge point. So it's now up to 13,000 per charge point. But we've also are seeking to encourage larger rollouts of charging, or rather rollouts of larger charging infrastructure projects by removing the pre-existing 100,000 maximum project cap so that um, larger scale projects can be introduced. Likewise, the new local EV infrastructure fund, the 90 million fund that I referred to earlier, will focus on large on-street and rapid hubs as well to be able to um, increase local authorities' engagement in this space again. We know it's not just all about funding though, so we are committed to producing um, some technical guidance, EV infrastructure technical guidance, which will be published later this year. Um, that's been developed by the Institute of Engineering sorry, and Technology. And we're sending out an information pack for all local authority CEOs. 
to highlight the support that's already available. So we know that many local authorities have already benefited from AUKS and are finding it really useful. But we also know that there are some um, areas which haven't engaged with it as much as maybe they could or would like to do so. We're continuing to fund the work of Energy Savings Trust, who offer impartial and expert advice and charging strategies. I'm not going to talk too much about that because I suspect Richard might refer to it as well. Um, but we'll also be setting up a new forum to help share best practice and raise awareness of what's already out there. I should say that all of these commitments are set out in the new delivery plan that came out yesterday as well. I think that's the fourth of the documents that came out yesterday. And it's the one I plug most because it's the one focused on EVs. So there's a lot going on, both in terms of what we're looking for from local authorities, but also in terms of how we want to support you in delivering in the, in the near and ongoing future. Can I have the final slide, please? And um, also last year, there was an announcement that government would be developing an EV charge point infrastructure strategy. And this is due out later this year, and it will pick up on that point about what are the roles of both local authorities, but also of central government, industry, regional bodies, etc. Because what we want to do is set up government's vision for infrastructure rollout across up to 2030 and beyond. So what do we think infrastructure should look like if you're a driver? How should you be able to access it? Where will you be able to find it? We're going to set out the route to a commercially led market that we expect to be ready for 2030 to 35 and how we will target government interventions on those areas, those parts of the market that struggle most commercially at the moment. We'll be setting out the roles and responsibilities for delivery and in more detail, further support and mechanisms for both local government and others in meeting those roles. And we expect to publish that later this year. And um, I know a number of you have already been feeding into forums we've had on it, but we're always interested to hear more about your views going forward. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you, Emily. That's That was a really useful overview of um, all the massive amount of work that's been uh, uh, carried out by OZA over the last few years and continues uh, to do so. Um, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and ask you one quick question, but a reminder, please do use the Q&A function and so you, many of you have and also uprate any questions that you're really interested in, in hearing an answer to so I can kind of gauge interest in those questions um, so that, that, that would be really useful from my point of view. So first off, I think you obviously mentioned the, the kind of local authority or sorry, local EV charging infrastructure fund, which is, I think, a new, new pot of money. Um, so that I think you mentioned 90 million and that it would include rapid charges as well. Is, is there any idea on the timing of that? Any other further details you could kind of provide? Because obviously local authorities will probably be one of the main beneficiaries uh, for, for that funding. So, yes. And anything else you can provide on, on that? And so we're working up the details of the fund at the moment and expecting to publish more on that later this year. Um, but the yes, it's a 90 million fund. The focus will be on those larger on-street um, rollouts, and that might so that may be on-street, but it might also be a local rapid charging hub if that's what's more appropriate for that area. Um, so both of those types of um, uh, approaches, and we're working with local authorities and experts at the moment to help inform how that fund should operate and how it fits best with our existing funding and support schemes. Fantastic. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm sure there might be some questions in, in the uh, that come in through the Q&A, so we might pick that up uh, later on in the in the panel session. Um, the one question that I'm I'm interested in as well is around kind of that. So that that new um, ambition on the HGVs does that. I suppose that does have implications on local authorities to a certain extent. Do you, do you see? The, any change in role or change in responsibilities for local authorities given that new kind of 2040 or 2035 deadline depending on the size of the HGVs um, has that kind of changed the game at all from, from your point of view at OZEV? Um, so there's a, not a great deal I can say on that at this point in time but I would as the emphasis obviously across not just OZEV but across the Department of Transport is the move to that place-based approach and making sure local authorities have the, uh, the tools they need to be able to take that approach. Um, we know that obviously HGVs are a new and emerging challenge and there's work that we're doing at the moment, both in terms of 
identifying different technologies and the charging technologies that might be needed to support that rollout. And obviously there is a place for local authorities in that discussion and that debate. But I think at, at this point in time, the, um, the encouragement is for people to respond to the HTV consultation in particular, if there are particular concerns from a local element that you want flagged and want to be discussed, that's the best way of doing it right now. Perfect. And I think, yeah, we, we should be able to drop a link to that in the chat or some some kind soul might be able to drop a link to that chat and in, in, in the chat, sorry, to the consultation, which has a lot more detail on it. Um, I will just pick one from the Q&A um, questions that we've have, having come in. So will local authority, will that local authority electric vehicle guidance that you mentioned there tie into local area energy plans? Because um, obviously that's that's kind of a crucial area of local energy well, yeah, local energy decision making and, and um, planning that's been happening over the last a few months and years. So I'm not sure if you can answer that one. That's a quite a tricky one, but <laughs> I, I thought I'd chuck it at you. It's a very specific one, that one. Um, so the so the talk at the sorry the guidance that I referred to that's coming out from IET that's specifically coming from OZEV specifically with an EV perspective. But within OZEV, we are working very closely with the teams that develop those local energy plans, essentially, at any rate, and we then link out uh, regionally. So there is join up happening. Um, I can't commit to exactly what the plan, what the guidance will say on local energy plans, but certainly as we're developing our strategy, it's part of our thinking about how do we join up? How do we make sure that local authorities aren't being asked to do multiple things, the same thing multiple times, either through local energy plans, our local transport plans, as EV plans, um, but equally or equally being asked to do slightly contradictory things. So it's definitely on our radar. Perfect. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, so that's an interesting area. Um, I think we're going to have to move on, though. Um, thank you very much, Emily. That was really useful. Um, we'll move on to some case studies, um, if I may. Um, so first up, we have Tom uh, from Durham County Council, who's going to give us the rundown of what's been happening in, in, in his area. Um, so carry away, carry on, Tom. Thanks, Ollie. Um, I think my slides will come up shortly. There they are. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me today. Um, I work as a carbon and energy project officer for Durham County Council. Um, and my role is attempting to facilitate emission reduction broadly for the council and the county. And that includes working on policy development around low carbon buildings, uh, the decarbonisation of heat, uh, renewable energy projects, um, and relevant for today, uh, projects linked to the electrification of transport. Um, my focus is specifically on the decarbonisation of our fleets, but I'll share some insight today from, from wider projects from colleagues in Durham. Um, so to, onto my first slide. And um, before we get into EVs, I thought I'd set the scene a little bit with some context about Durham. Um, uh, so we're a rural county covering 860 square miles of beautiful countryside um, with just over 525,000 people. 40% um, of our 240,000 dwellings are terraced housing. Um, and you can imagine the challenges that gives for electrification. Um, 20 million people visit our county each year as tourists. So there's a lot of people traveling to our county. We're on the East Coast main line, but, but most of those people traveling to our county come by a car. Um, and we have a wide range of natural capital from the coast uh, on, in the east uh, to the North Pennines in the west. Um, and we have industrial heritage, including a massive coal field that you may know about if you know anything about Durham, um, under much of the county. And we have uh, some amazing culture all around the year. Um, and as you can see from my photos, that it is always sunny in County Durham. Um, so in 2019, uh, Durham County Council declared a climate emergency. Uh, and in 2020, we set the target for the council's reduced emissions by 80% by 2030 uh, from 2008-9 levels and uh, in line with national targets to be net zero by 2050. In terms of reducing emissions linked to transport, our context gives us um, some challenges. Uh, challenges including a dispersed population that makes low carbon public transport much more complicated um, and in turn makes private journeys and private vehicles more frequent and possibly over a longer distance. Um, and, and whether those journeys are by residents within the county or visitors to the county. So we face the challenge of how, how do we facilitate charging, uh, electric vehicle charging for a dispersed population. And the terrace housing, as I've mentioned, makes the transition to electric vehicles for a large proportion of our population quite difficult. So how can we support this transition? So the question that I guess I'm answering today is what is our strategy to facilitate electric vehicles? Um, and my next slide, I'll start to talk about those strategies. 
Um, so we see electrification and transport as a key element in reducing emissions, both for the council and for the county. Um, and we've developed several strategies to demonstrate this. And th there are two public documents that I'm going to highlight today uh, that focus on this. Um, first of all, the Climate Emergency Response Plan um, that we published in 2020. Um, sorry, back, back on slides, thank you. Um, uh, and that followed a public and Durham County Council staff consultation about how we should respond to the Climate Emergency Declaration. Uh, and then secondly, the charge point delivery plan that sets out how we plan to facilitate charging in the county. So in the SERP, in the, in the Climate Emergency Response Plan, we made several key statements about vehicle decarbonisation amongst the breadth of broad, broader plans for broader decarbonisation. Um, so first of all, on DCC fleet, we pledged that we would um, install the necessary infrastructure to begin that transition to electric vehicles. Uh, in a hope that would be there'd be no excuse not to transition away from fossil fuel vehicles, really facilitating teams and, and services to move as quick as possible to uh, to electric vehicles. Uh, we said we transition electric vehicles for our pool cars as soon as possible, and that's a fairly small impact on our emissions, but it helps demonstrate the capability of electric vehicles across the council and the county. Um, we said for fleet as well that we transformed the Morrison Bus the uh, depot, which is one of the four strategic depots in the northwest of the county. Um, as a pilot to, to demonstrate how we can de decarbonize our depots across the county. But the SERP is not limited to our council activities. Um, so we made some statements to help facilitate electrification more broadly across the county as well. And we said we would deliver at least 100 community backed EV charge points that could be used by the public and that we would encourage and incentivize commercial uh, organizations to utilize electric vehicles or other low carbon technologies. And um, we'd help them switch to electric vehicles. So in the months following the SERP, we developed uh, the charge point delivery plan, um, which was quite a detailed document about how we plan to, to deliver charge points. Uh, and it has five key actions. So first of all, we're going to lead by example. We're going to provide charge points at council sites using, uh, we're going to use EVs in our fleet and we're going to facilitate electrification more broadly. Uh, number two, we're going to develop a network of public charge points across the county. Number three, we'll provide charging infrastructure for our fleet. Uh, number four, we'll support appropriate private sector proposals for charging infrastructure. Um, and number five, we'll pursue partnerships, we'll pursue funding, and we'll try and be involved with education. So we've, uh, and on, as well as that, we've also developed a strategy for fleet decarbonisation that I'll get into a little bit later on. So we've set out this vision for how we might transition County Durham. So what are we actually doing? If we go on to the next slide, please. So our first key action um, on the charge point delivery plan was the lead by example. So how are we doing that as a council? Um, I'd like to highlight a few projects. So first of all, the Morrison Bus, the low carbon depot projects that I mentioned. Um, and this is a part, fund, part ERDF funded project to build a, a really quite large solar farm. And I can't point, I don't think on the screen, but the, the kind of yellow field at the top of that image there is gonna be a solar farm, which makes me very excited. Um, and that's supported by a large battery um, in order to, to power extensive fast and rapid charge points with low carbon energy. And that we hope will facilitate the transition of, of the fleet base at that site, as well as providing charging for visitors to the site. And in the medium term, that will mean that all vehicles based at that site, including the refuse vehicles, which, which is a, a big challenge and probably something that I'd, uh, I'd love to be involved with that HGV conversation, um, uh, but including uh, electric RCVs. Also, in the last few months, we've moved all our pool cars to electric. And that's, as I said earlier, that's a smaller reduction in emissions, but it allows a broad range of people to experience charging and electric vehicle driving for the first time with minimal barriers. So we're hoping that uh, as a, uh, a kind of outreach to our, to our staff, we, we can prove we can prove and myth bust a lot of things about electric vehicles just through have, having them use uh, a, a pool car, but also demonstrate as, as our pool cars drive around the county that, that electric vehicles can operate perfectly. In County Durham. And so these pool cars will have a range of around 175 miles at 100% charge. So they can travel all across the county. And we have eight sites where pool cars can charge um, at 27 charge points with 54 plugs across council sites. Um, and these charge points are also available to fleet vehicles. Um, and having those charge points in first is almost a chicken or egg. Um, but putting them in first uh, builds the case for services to move to, um, to electric vehicles. And we have that fleet electrification strategy that will see 150 small and medium vans electrified in the next three years. Um, this will include some uh, home charging um, uh, at staff members' homes, 
um, and it'll, it'll include some more strengthening of charging infrastructure at our sites. And I think there are a couple of challenges in transitioning our fleet vehicles. Some of them are about EV education, some of them are about myth busting, um, some about proving that an electric vehicle can meet the demands of a no normal DCC vehicle. Um, but the main challenge for our own fleet electrification is cost. Uh, I'd say that today, many of the small and medium electric vehicles have a lower life cycle cost than diesel equivalent. But the larger vehicles, those are uh, refuse collection vehicles that I mentioned, have a considerably higher cost in the medium term. So planning for that cost of budgeting, to budgeting over the next uh, five to eight years is, is a challenge that we're, that we're working through at the moment. Um, but on top of the vehicles that funding charging infrastructure, which already has been costly for the council and is likely to continue to be costly as we strengthen it in the next five years. So that's where we're up to on fleet. Um, what about the council more broadly? Um, so next, next slide. Um, so we said we'd install 100 community-based charge points um, and we're almost halfway there as of today. Um, and we will have installed 160 charge points across the county in the next 12 months as part of three projects led by my colleague Tracy, who's in that photo there. I had to include Tracy in this presentation. Um, first is the Soski project. And I think some of the partners from Soski might be on the call today. So hello to you. Um, but Soski stands for Scaling On-Street Charging Infrastructure. Um, and that's attempting to deliver charge points in locations near to housing without off-street parking. Um, so that households without off-street parking are able to go electric when they are ready. Um, and, and Soski is a, a project not just in County Durham, but much wider than that. Um, as well as Soski, we are running projects including the Weardale Electric Vehicle Accelerator, and that's focusing on a, on a little town where my mother-in-law lives, which is, there's no, no link there, but it's nice, nice to know. Um, uh, and that's going to add charge points to Stanup, um, and so that you would never be more than five minute walk throughout, throughout that town from a charge point. And it's a bit of an experiment, a bit of a test bed that will help us learn lessons on how a community will respond to um, kind of accessible charging facilities within the town. Um, and alongside those charge points, we'll be facilitating a new electric car club in Stanhope as well. And then finally, the, the DOCS project, the Durham Other Charge Points, is, is a project that's installing 50 charges across the county in collaboration with parish councils in an attempt to spread out charging in every community in the county. Most of the charges we're putting in are 22 kilowatt charges that are on the top end of the fast charging uh, label. And we hope that these three projects will form a comprehensive network of charging infrastructure across the county. Um, we have come up, some, up against some challenges, including land ownership um, to install the charge point, including negotiation with DNOs to facilitate electricity supply, and then escalating costs with new connections, uh, particularly in, in, in rural locations. So alongside the charge point installations, we, are, uh, we run a community EV users group that allows EV users to share their perspective and their gripes and their suggestions on, uh, on, on where we're putting charge points. And it's, it's actually been quite helpful to identify charge point locations to ex and, and to communicate decision making to, to the public. Um, and our former climate champion, who, who is, is also in the picture there, um, was keen that, that officers at the council are engaging with members of the public, public on, on this rather than working in a silo. And that's key to, to our strategy. So uh, at the start, I also said we would help facilitate the EV transition for, for small and medium businesses. So to do this, we've just ordered four electric vans that will form a two year scheme um, loaning vehicles to SMEs uh, in County Durham alongside our BEEP or Business Energy Efficiency Program. Uh, and that'll, there'll be short term loans that will help demonstrate to SMEs that they could go electric and still carry out their work. Um, we haven't found many challenges so far in the scheme because it's not started, um, but we have ordered the vehicles and the main challenge is that the wait time for new EVs is, is, is around 20 weeks at the moment, which is amazing really and shows how much demand there is for small and medium vans today. Um, so we'll be looking to launch the scheme formally in the autumn. So as, that's everything I have prepared to say. I hope that's helpful explaining the kind of projects we're doing in County Durham in a rural county. Um, there are other projects that I haven't mentioned and other detail that I can expand on if needed. Um, but for us, great getting strategies in place has helped us develop um, and set out a direction for EV charging, for fleet transition and for facilitating the public transition. Um, but we've got a long way to go, um, but we've definitely made a start. Perfect. Thanks, Tom. Um... Yeah, a whole range of different projects there. <clears throat> Before we move on to Oxford, uh, I'll just throw a few questions that we've had in the ch in the Q and A function. So, uh, a reminder: please do continue to use the Q and A function and upgrade the questions that you want answered. Um, a few specific ones for you, 
are um, so how does uh, Durham County Council uh, plan to install charge points in areas where there is no commercial interest perhaps in areas with high levels of deprivation and I suppose rural areas as well you could add on to that um, could you answer that one quickly thanks uh, yeah good question um, I'm, I'm definitely not the expert on uh, to answer that question but I as I understand that the docs project is is intending to put to put a uh, charge points kind of fairly and and equitably around the county and um, in in partnership with parish councils so um so that each parish council can have at least one charging station rather than focusing on main hubs of activity um, and we hope that will spread out um charging across um, across the county fairly um, that's perfect Thanks, um, Tom. Um, it does relate to another question at the top of the the answer tree, but I think I'll leave that to the panel session because that's a really interesting one and that kind of covers the the kind of just transition aspect which you've just touched on. But if I just uh, cover, so there's a question around the Morrison Busty Solar Farm and whether you run that in house or with a partner. I'm not sure if you can answer that one. Yeah, so we're we're managing the project in in house. Um, we've had external consultants uh, do design work for the the kind of end, the meaty engineering of it, and it's been delivered by a an external contractor. Um, we're funding forty percent of the cost of that project, and uh, ERDF is meeting sixty percent. Um, and yeah, very exciting project that's just started on site and will be commissioned within twelve months. So um, yeah, really fantastic project. Excellent. Yeah, I look forward to seeing some lovely kind of drone footage of that solar farm and the batteries and yeah, they're beautiful. And There's I'm, a picture I'm, of me in a, high in a high vis on a field that uh, I could share. <laughs> so that's it. Next time, next time. And I'm, I'm very happy that your mum's going to get a charger in her village as well. That, that's that's crucial, crucial. Keep, keep the mum happy. Um, I'll move on to Oxford, if I may. Thank you very much, Tom. Much appreciated. Um, so, yeah, Lizzie from Oxford County Council is up next and going to cover some of the amazing work they've been up to. Over to you, Lizzie. Okay, hopefully my slide should pop up soon as well. Um, I'm Lizzie, uh, or Elizabeth, if you're looking for my email, Elizabeth Bohan from Oxfordshire County Council. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our EV infrastructure strategy and, and what we're doing now to start delivering on that. Um, I uh, work as part of the Innovation Hub at Oxfordshire County Council, um, and within that we have a small but dedicated EV, uh, EV integration team, and our role is to uh, work on innovative new technologies, new business models and new ideas, um, take the learning from those and try and translate the best of that into business as usual for the council. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I thought um, that I would uh, I'd put this slide up, um, which shows a little bit of um, the motivation for us to really get on and draft an EV infrastructure strategy. You can see in the blue line um, there, that's the predicted growth of battery electric vehicles in Oxfordshire over uh, the coming decades. Um, and this is based purely on, on sales figures. Um, and as you can see, that's that's ahead of the, the national UK curve um, based on the same data. Um, so this is this is not including any kind of external influences or, or policy changes. So this is um, without even um, the advent of the, the new announcement on, um, on ending ICE sales. So without any other kinds of um, input or influence based on purely sales alone, we can see that Oxford is already going to be ahead of the curve. And we've got a, a task to do to try and meet the needs of people in Oxfordshire who want to switch over to EV. Next slide, please. Um, so here in Oxfordshire, prior to setting up our EV infrastructure strategy, um, we've uh, run several projects, um, both ourselves at Oxfordshire County Council and Oxford City Council have also been very active in the field, um, as well as some of our other districts who've been doing some of the, the, um, the projects out in the more rural areas. Um, and what we did was, um, was to review really where we were with um, EV charging infrastructure across the county and try and understand some of the learning, some of the challenges that we've seen with some of our projects. And you can see here some, some um, some of the outcomes of that. The key um, for us was finding that there's really a variation, it, it's patchy um, and it's really EV infrastructure was limited to the more uh, densely populated 
towns um, and particularly in Oxford City. So our rural communities, um, which is, you know, accounts for quite a large section of the population, were really very underserved when it comes to public EV charging infrastructure, particularly those who um, don't have a driveway. And, and whilst we do get that even out in rural areas, there's a lot of very old terrace properties, um, medieval villages and um, places that were really before the advent of cars, let alone EVs. Um, one of the things that we did um, as part of our suite of projects was uh, a Go Ultra Low City Scheme funded project called Go Ultra Low Oxford, which was led by um, Oxford City Council in partnership with us at the County Council, which looked at on street EV charging and tested a number of different technologies uh, to try and understand what the best options would be for, uh, for people um, living in Oxford and Oxfordshire. Um, and altogether, um, some of the, you know, the real key learnings were that in order to make the best use of the available technology and the learnings that we gathered, we needed to work together as a group of authorities across Oxfordshire to have a joined up approach and really serve the public well. Next slide, please. And so the EV infrastructure strategy um, was born as a concept. Um, we worked with all of our partner councils in Oxfordshire, so ourselves as the county council and the highways authority, and then the district councils and the city council. We formed a working group um, of officers um, who brought together a lot of ideas, um, which we then put to senior management and to our lead members uh, to promote the idea of an EV infrastructure strategy. Uh, we then formed a, a working um, group that made met on a regular basis to develop that further and we were guided by a steering group of councillors and a project board on which were representatives from each of the district councils. Um, and that work was really informed by um, a lot of the project that we were working on. You can see some examples of those um, on the slide there and the expertise that officers working in different areas of the council could bring um, through planning expertise, people working with car parks, highways, regulation and licensing, and, and those who work with the wider community and businesses across the, across the county. Uh, so the strategy itself is obviously Oxfordshire wide. It's really focused on cars and car-based vans and takes an operational approach to what we can do to enable and deploy infrastructure for the public over the short term. So that's 2020 uh, 20 to 2025, um, when we're gonna really see the start of a major uptick. Um, what, we, what we think is that the inflection curve um, in that S shape will start to come at around 2027. So by getting in infrastructure into place by 2025, we'll set ourselves in a good position um, to build on that as demand increases over time. Next slide, please. So within that strategy, um, we looked at where we could have the most influence and make the most impact. Um, and we felt that those were the areas which are under our direct control. If you click onwards. And again. Uh, so, uh, and again. So that's charging on the highways, and charging in car parks which are run by councils. That's great, thank you. Um, so key policies that we set out in that strategy were to develop a specific policy for on-street EV charging and how we're going to support the uh, 36, approximately 36% of people across Oxfordshire as a whole who have no access to being able to charge at home because they park on the street. So we'll be looking at at writing that and I'll go into a little more detail on that later in the presentation. We also set a target for ourselves to um, increase the um, amount of EV charging in our car parks so that seven and a half percent of all of our car parking spaces are covered by an EV charger socket um, and we've then decided that we'd like to set some Oxfordshire standards uh, which go above and beyond the, the kind of national um, standards for users in Oxfordshire to, to future-proof anything that we procure or license um, to make sure that it, it's fit for the coming years 
as well as looking at managing the grid impact of where we're installing um, EV chargers. If you click onwards. So we then come to where we've got direct influence and most of that is through planning policy, either through ourselves um, at the county council in terms of strategic and transport planning, or through the district councils and their influence on um, development management. Um, and the, the two key areas we're focusing on is uh, upgrading our planning policies to make sure that 25% of parking in new developments is fitted with EV charging. So that's, um, you know, in addition to the changes to building regulations which are coming, so individual properties will all have a, a charger, but any unallocated parking whether it's residential or commercial, must have 25% of the spaces served by an EV charger. And um, we also looked at managing the impact of charge points in heritage areas, which we've got lots and lots of. And I did see a comment in the chat from someone living in the Cotswolds um, who's having some issues with, uh, with exactly that problem. So if you're an Oxfordshire Cotswolds person, then please do um, get in touch if, you, if you'd like to. Um, next, please. Okay, and then we come to our um, our wider influence. Um, so promoting EVs and infrastructure, looking at workplace car parks, commercial car parks, and what we can do with those private residential car parks at, at blocks of flats or, or, or developments, which already exist. Next slide, please. Um, so, very briefly, I'm aware that we don't have a huge amount of time, but um, what we wanted to do was to set some standards, as I said, that go above and beyond what's nationally required um, to create what we believe would be a truly open network. So we want easy and consistent access to anyone who wants to use a charge point, regardless of what network that charge point is run on. Um, so we're really focusing on um, the reliability and the quality of that, but also a true instant access where um, you know people can either use a sort of tap and go wireless or really wanting to promote roaming for um, for customers across networks. So we'd be using that when we procure to make sure that our um, our EV chargers meet those standards. Um, next slide, please. I think um, a, a few people have picked up on the chat um, as I've been I've been watching uh, through some of the challenges of charging without a driveway. Um, and it is something that's obviously been um, in our minds for, for quite a long time. Uh, some of the lessons that we've learned from our experiments with on-street EV charging um, is that we, we don't feel that there's a panacea. We don't feel that there's gonna be a one size fits all solution to how to support people. Um, who need to park on the street. And so what we've done is to come up with a, a hierarchy or framework of solutions um, for residents to access, which would prioritise options which avoid street clutter or the, the, you know, the surrounding business case and maintenance challenges which we see with those. So um, we're looking at off-street charging hubs, which are, um, it, at the moment, our first uh, tranche will be in uh, local authority car parks which are close you know within a five minute walk of areas where there's high density of on-street parking then looking at low impact on-street charging either with using um, pavement channels for for cables or lamp column charges where the lamp columns are in the right location and then recognizing that in some places and for some people it's really going to be an on-street charging bollard which is necessary whether that's for car clubs who need a higher power um, of uh, charging or for people who've got additional mobility needs and maybe can't walk um, to a, a charge point hub or bend to use a gully. One of the things that we're going to do in order to, to push this forward is, as I said, developing that detailed policy um, so that we can uh, set up a licensing scheme for roadside charging, um, building on the existing Section 50 licenses, um, but adding in more um, more detail that gives us some control over who are the, the right and proper organisations to um, to hold the responsibility for EV charging on the highway uh, and making sure that we've got some powers to enforce against any poor maintenance or poor management of those charges. 
Next slide, please. Um, so I thought I'd also talk about some of the active projects. Um, we are at the beginning of our, our journey in um, deploying uh, the charging uh, to meet the needs that we've identified in our strategy. Uh, but one of our flagship projects is the Park and Charge Oxfordshire project, which is funded by uh, Innovate UK, working with some, um, some partners in Oxfordshire to develop EV charging hubs. Um, and as mentioned previously, these are really focused on residents who don't have off-road parking. So we're looking at sites where there's, um, as you can see on the, on the picture on the on the slide, uh, we've used some mapping tools to identify where there are streets which have high on-street parking and to locate the car parks which are, are run by local councils uh, which are in the right locations to be able to serve these people um, within a short walk of home. So we're looking at rolling out um, up to 280 charge points. They are going to be uh, 7 to 22 kilowatt fast chargers and we felt this was appropriate because people will be parking up and using them overnight so we can get the, the benefits of um, the flexible smart charging that you can do with a, with a fast charger. Um, and these charges will also double up during the daytime as destination charging for people visiting our towns and villages across Oxfordshire. Next slide, please. And the final project that I want to talk to you about today is our Ox Gully project. Um, we've just been successful in winning funding for a second phase of this project um, with a trial of um, the gullies in real life. It's a, it's a concept which is um, deceptively simple. Um, the, the simple bit being the actual technology itself. Uh, we're working with our partners Oxford Direct Services um, in Oxford to deliver this and um, it's built on a concept which was trialled in the Go Ultra Low Oxford project so it's a nice um, growth on from that from that project funding we had there. What we're doing is using uh, a now purpose-built channel which is recessed into the pavement and sits uh, flush with the pavement. It's installed permanently outside a property which doesn't have a driveway and allows people to uh, connect their car parked at the curbside with their home charger by inserting their charging cable when it's in use into the channel, which is held in place um, and removes the trip hazard from either a, a loose trailing cable or unfortunately the, the cable covers, which can prove to be a problem. And we've had some incidents with in Oxfordshire. Um, so this project will be running now that the second phase of it um, from August until March. And we're planning to do uh, a, um, a pilot of 30 installations across Oxfordshire. Um, and we'll be sharing the outputs of that trial and, and hoping to see that this is something that we can build on and turn into business as usual here in Oxfordshire. It's a really low cost um, solution and we think um, could be really helpful, particularly in, in rural areas where um, it's not attractive to install um, a kind of public EV charger network. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lizzie. Um, yeah, a really comprehensive overview of so much going on in o Oxfordshire uh, County Council, apologies, and uh, the surrounding okay. area. Um, so yeah, plenty of discussion in the chat. So thank you for that reminder. Please do use the chat and then also uh, use the question and answer function if you have specific questions. I'll just pick up one from a guy who is from Baines, Bath and North East, East Somerset. And he, well, actually, I think you kind of covered on the last slide, but um, he was answer, he was interested in knowing um, you, your enabling of private charging on public highway through slot drain or other interventions so we can offer residents in Baines. Um, so ODC, so that's Oxford Direct's Direct. O Oxford Direct Services. They Service. are the, um, the the local authority traded company um, attached to Oxford City Council, um, who worked with on the original Ultra Low Oxford project. Perfect. I, I suppose for other local authorities that are interested in that, they might be able to kind of contact those them directly and, and discuss yes, options. Absolutely. 
Yeah, okay. absolutely. Well, we, we can include some details in, in the, the follow up email as well, where we include all the slides. Um, so that's a reminder that uh, that will be included. Uh, I suppose just a very quick question before, because um, we're running a little bit behind schedule, um, was um, so you, you've got a lot of experience on the different on street charging solutions you've gone through some of the issues there so, so are you kind of really are you saying that kind of and i really like that kind of hierarchy you've, you've gone through in terms of kind of charging hubs and then uh, lower impact and then ultimately ultimately bollards are there any kind of specific solutions apart from the kind of gully one you just mentioned that you would pick out as a really really good option for local authorities to look at in a bit more detail well i think um it's one of those things where we found that there's pros and cons to each each approach that we've that we've trialed and we've trialed quite a few even outside of the the go to low oxford project we've even tried pop-up charges um and um we've worked on the virgin park and charge project which is bollards combined with taking power supplies from existing um virgin media cabinets and those sorts of things um so i i think it's a question which is really really difficult to answer um definitively but there's definitely some which will which will create a situation in which there are lower costs for councils in terms of the ongoing revenue costs so with the with the gully that's something which is significantly attractive to us because um, it's something which we think in the long run could even be a resident funded option much like having a drop curb installed but without the need to concrete over green spaces even more than is already happening um uh, and so that lack of ongoing um revenue costs for maintenance and, and hosting of um apps and um back offices is really attractive to us because we've seen that so far the business case for having a concession network of on-street bollards or, or lamp column charges has has been really difficult to get and to continue um we've found that um, actually the, the, the scale of the concession is, is reducing in terms of what's offered to local authorities within that um, and additional revenue costs are, are added in quite often. Either that or it's very focused on those very highly commercial yep. areas um, and you know for rural areas it's, it's, it's a real challenge. So we're very interested in options which allow um, customers to connect to their own home power. Um, and Oxqually is not the only project that we're looking into. We're also funded um, for another project with um, with Trojan um, Energy Systems as well, which is looking at the same kind of concept of connecting to people's home power. Um, I think that's something which which we'll continue to explore as a, a different business model. Fascinating. Thank you, Lizzie. And that actually ties into a couple of other questions on kind of just transition and pricing, because getting access to home charging, you obviously get that those off peak yeah. rates that you can kind of benefit yeah. from from a consumer as well. So yeah. thank you very much, Lizzie. I think we'll, we'll kind of quickly move on um, and we'll continue asking ask your ask your questions because we'll be picking them up in the panel session in just a second. Um, so uh, apologies, Richard, we're running slightly behind schedule, uh, but um, I will hand over to you and I'm sure you'll be able to get, get us back on track. <laughs> um, I'll do my best. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Just wait for the slides to pop up. Excellent. Hi, everybody. So yeah, uh, Richard Drew here from the Energy Saving Trust. I'm going to spend uh, the next 10 minutes or so just outlining some of the opportunities and support available to local authorities through the Energy Saving Trust and specifically introducing you to the Local Government Support Programme. Um, so if we just go on to the next slide, please. I won't dwell on this one too long, just to sort of outline a little bit about who we are. So uh, Energy Saving Trust or EST, we do love a, an acronym in this industry, but we're an independent organisation working to address the climate emergency with a focus on providing expert impartial advice and guidance. So if we can move on to the next slide. So this is just a little um, a little overview of the Local Government Support pr Programme, or if you like an acronym, we're LGSP. Um, it's a fully funded Department for Transport um, project, so in our role is to support transport decarbonisation and improved air quality for local authorities in England specifically. Um, we The support we offer is free and impartial, and we specialise particularly in electric vehicle electric vehicle infrastructure and sustainable staff travel and um, just want to touch on the infographic here kind of shows how we aim to deliver this so we 
we're looking to upskill officers and uh, on the subject of electric vehicles, infrastructure and sustainable travel. Uh, and at the same time, we also help aim to help accelerate the delivery of uh, the, the EV infrastructure in particular through reviewing and supporting strategy development and the procurement process and other activities around that. And then finally, we believe that, and I think this is really key in all of this, and I hope this is, this is what we're kind of seeing through, through events like today, is that collaboration and knowledge sharing between local authorities is vital. Also between, I think, local authorities and suppliers, uh, vice versa. And it's about learning from the experience of others and understanding that there's really no need to reinvent the wheel. So that's sort of Part of what we aim to do. If we can uh, go on to the next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to do a very brief summary of what in the local government support program entails. There's quite a lot on here, so I'm just going to touch on some of the um, some of the key areas. But really, the program is intended to offer dedicated support, and as such, we've we've kind of developed a series of products which can be categorised in the three strands that you see on the on the screen now. So that's delivering a public charge point network some further EV actions and also sustainable travel support. But that said, we, we also can sort of tailor the support that we offer as required if there's any spe anything specific a local authority is looking to do. And I think um, talking, looking at thinking about upskilling officers and accelerating delivery, the first strand around delivering a public charge point network is probably the main, main one there. Um, so the first one on the top of the list there is sort of workshop delivery. So we've, we've, we've uh, developed a fairly comprehensive package of um, modules uh, that we've delivered for a number of local authorities already, and they cover everything from uh, EV 101, sort of introduction to the subject of electric vehicles and infrastructure to uh, things to consider around developing a strategy, uh, network de deliveries to looking at um, procurement and delivery models and things like that, and also uh, information around planning guidance and engagement activities and all sorts of other things around that. Uh, in addition to the workshop, and uh, quite often, perhaps as a precursor to a workshop is our sort of strategy reviews and that's around offering some impartial advice on some of the um, draft or current strategy documents that we're seeing um, as well as uh, and by doing that we'll aim to sort of identify some additional points to add and any sort of useful extra information um, just to sort of uh, ensure it's a really sort of clear uh, uh, and uh, concise document. Um, I wasn't going to touch too much on site selection, but I have seen it. It's come up a little bit in, in the chat. I'm not going to touch on it in much detail because um, it's been very popular. So there's quite a lot of demand for it, um, so, but, but we certainly can offer it if that's something you're, you're keen to do. But it's it's kind of a, a, a map-based analysis, as has been said, where we look to sort of identify some suitable locations as in areas within a, a, a town or city rather than specific locations for a car park uh, for, for charge points. But that can be for on street and car park locations. And it is, I guess it's a really useful part of that initial planning for, for infrastructure delivery. Um, the other things that we can do around that is procurement support. That's becoming particularly popular, particularly looking at uh, aiming to answer questions, reviewing draft document, but also uh, aiming to share best practice because there are a number of local authorities that have uh, either gone through the procurement process already or, or quite far down the line. So I think that's a really useful thing to do. And we're currently doing a piece of engagement work directly with charge point operators to sort of understand their take on local authority procurement. And we're, we're going to use that sort of inf information to help us better support local authorities in this piece of work. Um, additional, additional aspects of what we do is around sort of things like um, further guidance on developing uh, charge points uh, or plat, uh, charge point for new developments or ensuring charge points going in the right place in new developments and, and looking at some of the other approaches taken by other councils and also reviewing any current or planned standards. And we also, uh, what is proving quite popular is our Go Electric sessions, which are kind of a short online sessions about electric vehicles and charging and, and um, myth busting and all that sort of thing for public sector employees, um, which it, it is also another thing that is proving popular and is, is, and is free as part of our support. And the final strand there is kind of around sustainable travel support. So certainly pre-COVID, uh, the, the development or up, updating of travel plans was proven quite popular amongst many local authorities. Um, obviously, the impact of COVID-19 has sort of meant that quite a lot of what you would put in a travel plan has been sort of dealt with. But we're beginning to see that um, a need for post-COVID planning around how we're getting to and from work to, to come back to the fore. So and we do have some sort of best practice documents and a, and a, a template, sort of an outline template to help people plan a new uh, document from scratch. And then the final one I'm going to touch on is business and community engagement support. So it's around um, once you've delivered a network, sort of promoting it uh, to all the various different users, but uh, 
and we're beginning to see a rollout of that. We've also sort of combined that with a new dedicated SME engagement offer that's going to support initially taxing private hire drivers, but there's something specific for van users and driving instructors. So there's going to be some masterclasses and uh, that help to understand the vehicles and also some uh, some test drive sessions that we're hopefully going to roll out. And, and some of the first today is going to be taking place in Oxford, but we're quite keen to hear from other authorities that might be interested in doing that sort of thing. Uh, so I've rattled through what we do. I've just got a, a couple of case studies. So if we go on to the next slide, please. First one is just some work we've we, we've done for Dorset Council. So we've we've we initially worked with Dorset to sort of deliver a review of their EV strategy. It proved to be a really comprehensive and well thought out document. And then from that, we sort of supported them in delivering a workshop. For, for the team, the key team members that are going to be involved in delivery of the strategy, uh, and as part of that, we looked at the main requirements for an EV network delivery, so things like ownership models, um, considering procurement options, looking at sort of the, the, the requirements in terms of what users might expect from their network, and also looking at beginning to look at things like trends in EV demand to try and sort of understand what the future take up might be for electric vehicles and where where the a network might need to go as the strategy develops and is being delivered. Um, and then we then, uh, 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 the second part of that was we sort of split up into breakout rooms and had a facilitated discussion amongst the teams just to understand uh, whether there are any additional requirements uh, for the strategy and, and also how best to implement it. And I think that was a really useful thing. The team at Dorset found that really useful. Um, and as a kind of a separate piece of work to that, we also um, have started, well, not separate, but linked to that, it, we've started doing uh, some of the charge point location assessment to help support the planned rollout of the new charge points. Um, we have also delivered uh, in partnership with Dorset Council, Visit Dorset and also uh, uh, at Bournemouth Christchurch and Pool. Apologies for not having the logo on there, but we've also delivered two webinars primarily for, for Visit Dorset just to help uh, support the tourism sector both in the uptake of EV for their own fleets. That was the subject of the first webinar and then a follow-up webinar looking at uh, how to provide uh, infrastructure for uh, visitors to uh, destinations or even and guests at hotels and B&Bs and um, we had some of our EST, some of our own fleet colleagues supporting us there. We also had a representative from the distribution network operator which was really useful to help sort of uh, particularly for the destinations, for the, for the charging considerations and how to install charges that was really useful and also a case study from a local hotel operator um, who, who'd also had some experience of, of putting charge points in. We can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, this next one is uh, some work we've done for Leicestershire, uh, Leicestershire councils, both Leicestershire County Council and the districts, and their, um, it's called the Midlands Energy Hub, which is part of the Local Enterprise Partnership. So initially, we ran a series of workshops just to build knowledge of EV charging and infrastructure and what the local authority role in delivery is but also to map out sort of what current commitments and goals are around charge point delivery to understand kind of what's, what's what could be done to support and promote collaboration between the districts and the, the, the county and also the energy hub. And then we followed that up by um, two workshops specifically for the county council uh, because they were looking to bring, I guess, uh, bring relevant internal stakeholders together to sort of discuss the challenges and opportunities around EV charging as well as then helping to, and that would help to scope out their work on this sort of charging agenda. And then, um, then follow this up by enabling them to consult on the priorities for a potential future EV strategy and, and kind of gauge what level of involvement the council should have um, across the region. So I'll, you'll be pleased to know the last couple of slides from me. So the next one, um, if we go on to the next slide, please, is just thought I'd touch on a little bit around the AUKS on street residential charge point scheme. So um, here in uh, my role within the local government support program, we, we're not directly involved with AUKS, but we, but here at Energy Saving Trust, we do manage uh, the application process on behalf of OZEV. So um, the, if you are in the process of or interested in the AUKS team here at Energy Saving Trust, will support you through the application process and they're gonna they, they basically ensure that all bids are uh, ready to an acceptable standard before submitting to OZEV for approval and then formal provision of a grant offer letter. Uh, the, the kind of the work that, LGSP can do to support that is all those things that we've talked about. I talked about in the summary, but it's, it's basically we, we'll aim to maximise the benefits of the AUX funding for you. We can help you to build uh, an AUX application to your planned or current strategy. We can help you with uh, obviously identify the potential locations. We can look at, uh, and then once you've got to, to delivery, then we can also help to engage with the residents and all that sort of thing. So it's really, we, we'll aim to complement some of these initiatives around 
uh, an AUX application. And just a couple of things, I suppose, to clarify around AUX, I'm sure you'll all be aware, but uh, it's currently 20 million pounds this financial year. Um, and uh, it's, although it's, uh, and it must be operational by the 31st of March 2023. So you've got a little bit longer to install the charge points. Um, a few little stats. So we had 18 grant offer letters uh, so far with about 19 applications in process. But there's been a significant number of expressions of interest in the fund this year. So we're up to 74 so far. So it's been a really popular fund uh, this year. And uh, I'll just move on to one more slide. This is the, the final little bit of information uh, from us. Just really about keeping up to speed. So. Um, just want to point out our webinar program. We've 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 had a sit. We've had webinars ongoing since the local government support program launched in back in the, in the early part of 2019. All there's lots of you can you know, can access all the previous webinars we've delivered on various subjects via our web page, which the link to which will be sent out. Um, what might be of interest to you all at the moment is that there's a couple of forthcoming webinars from the AUX team, and that's going to be around uh, AUX application for rural authorities and another one for two tier authorities, which I think will probably be really popular. And that is me. Perfect. Thank you, Richard. Apologies for uh, rushing mm. you slightly at the end. That's um, right. <laughs> it's, it's my failure as chair to try and uh, manage our time. So, uh, But there's lots of really good questions and it's been a really uh, useful session so far. So thank you, Richard. Okay, I think we'll move to our panel session now. We've got a slightly condensed amount of time uh, for our panel, but hopefully it will still be uh, of use and we'll try and get through as many of your questions uh, as possible. So please do continue putting them in the Q&A and uprate um, uh, or like uh, the ones that you're particularly interested in us answering. If I can go to Ashley first, because she's a new arrival um, from a kind of charge point operator perspective, um, just to give a give a quick introduction to to your kind self and um, your company, if that's okay. Thank you, Ollie. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Braun. Uh, I'm from Connected Curb, whose mission it is um, to accelerate the the transition to um, sustainable mobile sustainable mobility for everyone. Um, we do that for a number of uh, things, mainly the design of our technology, which um, is smart, is subterranean and um, as discreet as possible. We also look at sustainable business uh, cases for authorities in particular. So we're aware there's a lot of challenges, um, but luckily have many of the solutions that um, have, have shown some success across the country so far. Um, but key, I think, as well, is um, we see ourselves as long-term partners. Infrastructure is a, a long-term um, investment for councils and companies alike. Um, and so we're, we're here to, for the long run um, to help that community engagement and transition um, as we move towards our, our national target. Perfect. Thank you, Ashley. That's uh, brilliant. So um, there's lots of questions. So I think um, there was a couple of quick kind of policy questions that hopefully Emily will be able to, to help me with. Um, so one was around the building rigs and the changes around EV charge point requirements uh, for that. I th think that might have been mentioned in the transport decarbonisation plan that was announced yesterday. Do you have any ideas on when a kind of full response on the building regs might be coming out, Emily? Um, so the plan is later this year. But I can't give you an absolute date, I'm afraid. No problem. Uh, it's a very busy time for uh, policymakers at the moment. Plenty uh, going on there. Um, so I think maybe kind of a, a more general question. Uh, yeah, so I think the, the kind of second one down in terms of our popularity there is around uh, I'm finding most local authorities don't have a person to look after um, EVs uh, and ends up with someone that has an interest. Um, so is it is there a plan to give local authorities funding to put in an EV team? So I suppose maybe just get some views on that from the panel, if I may. Um, perhaps if we could start with Lizzie and then I might go to Tom and then um, perhaps Richard as well. So yeah, Lizzie, if I start with you in terms of how you've developed your team around um, EVs. Um, well, essentially, our team is project funded. Um, so we um, we bring in money for projects, and that um, allows us to well to to deliver the work that we're doing. Um, most of our project funding has come from Innovate UK over the last few years. Uh, we're a relatively new team; we've only been in existence for the last two and a half years um, now. Um, uh, but yeah. Uh, it is entirely project funded for us. 
Okay, so yeah, I suppose that's that's reliant on being being able to do the grant funding and get that get the goes those projects um, in and uh, get those kind of consortiums together. So that, yeah, that, that's that's good to know. Um, Tom, can I have your view on that in terms of how you kind of created your team and fund your work time? We're, we're very similar um, pro project funded. Um, we're we're very conscious that electric vehicles and broader decarbonisation is here to stay. So how do we plan for that as a local authority and how do we budget that in our medium term financial plans is is a is a ongoing challenge and a question we have for for senior finance people. Um, there there is a risk if 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 projects did not continue past their their deadline that um, people like me would would not have a job um, and therefore we don't get our climate climate emergency targets simple as um, so um, that's not me being big headed, but but not not having the people to work on those projects is is, is a big issue, and that and that means electric vehicle um, rollout would 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 stall uh, locally. So so having that having a fund possibly to to pay for for staff would be very very helpful. Fantastic, thanks, Tom. Um, that's good feedback to hear. Um... Richard, yeah, I suppose you've, you'd be working with a, a selection of local authorities. Have you got any thoughts on this? Obviously, you provide a certain amount of support. Um, is that kind of like a finite amount of support or is it how, how does it work there? Um, so we I mean, I guess our support is, you know, advice and guidance rather than, you know, often we are approached by authorities looking for somebody that, you know, because they don't have the resource, like has been said, to, to sort of deliver the uh, more meaty piece of work of actually writing things like strategies and procurement processes. And I think, yeah, there's there's there's, there's obviously a, a gap there that, that needs filling. Uh, I, I come from a public sector background as well. I used to work in a local authority myself, and I know, you know, it's all about, as, as Ian Thomas said, it's all about project funding. So uh, that said, I guess we see a lot more um, job titles, things like climate change manager coming through when working with local authorities. So I think there is, you know, it, it, I guess it depends what kind of angle that the local authority is looking at, but we do see more sort of experts looking at it from a climate change perspective. And just following up on that, so I think there's a question around um, for you, Richard, around um, kind of reinventing the wheel. So is there a potential to have some kind of strategy, EV strategy template or work, workshop to kind of give those local authorities a, a framework to, to work within rather than just starting from a kind of blank sheet of paper because i can imagine that is quite daunting yeah I, I think that's yeah that's certainly something we can do there's lots of we've got some good examples of strategies that we're able to share and there are some really good examples out there sort of publicly available um you know it, it does very much depend on what kind of authority you know there's a big difference between sort of the two-tier authorities that, that come to sort of be that break the highways authority and then look at sort of districts to to deliver a piece of work as opposed to a unitary authority, but there's some really good examples out there. But yes, you know, perhaps a some sort of template or at least uh, guidance. I mean, that, that's that is what our workshop package looks to do. Um, but yeah, perhaps something that's uh, sort of a, a written document. Yeah, could certainly be something we could put together. Okay. I've noted that and we'll take it, take <laughs> it away for consideration. <laughs> take that one away. So I'd, I think I'd like to cover, which is the top question actually, was around kind of getting charge points uh, and getting charging available for those uh, kind of that kind of for, for those in kind of more deprived areas those obviously that don't have um, off-street parking the ability to have their own home charger um, and I, I, I kind of I'm, I'm in this boat in terms of uh, not having access to an off-street parker so I'm definitely kind of kind of it, it's a it's a potentially big issue as i'm wondering if there's a question around what's a fair price to pay uh, for your charging um if you can't charge at home because obviously those at home might be able to get maybe five pence a kilowatt hour or eight pence a kilowatt hour depending on how what kind of tariffs they've got um and those that have to charge publicly have to pay considerably more as as kind of the one of the um uh questions uh, has mentioned does anyone have a kind of uh, thoughts? And maybe, maybe if I go to Ashley first in terms of a charge point operator's point of view there around w what kind of pricing you think um, is kind of a fair price for, let's say, a fast charger. When, we're not talking about rapids because I think that's kind of that's a slightly different ball game. But maybe if we stick to around the fast charging um, kind of cost AC, yeah. Well, I mean, the way that we would approach this. This, um, this concern and challenge is to look at a, a town, for example, and try to balance the network by having some charge points that are in more profitable locations, say balancing the ones that are, are based in, in less profitable ones. 
the technology that we use allows us to be, uh, create variable rates. So um, you can have a lower charge of electricity if you're charging overnight, as opposed to off peak, uh, on peak when you're charging during the day. Um, but so I think, um, you know, the, the solutions that offer a range of different um, models. And for us, it would be very much working with the local authority to work out, do they want to make a sustainable revenue from this project? Or are they providing just a public service? And therefore, we would work to, to develop a model that would allow them to just charge at the, the lowest possible cost um, that we could achieve. Great, thanks. And does anyone else want to come in on that in terms of pricing? I'll leave it open for maybe Lizzie in terms of some of your kind of charges and how you how you've kind of gone about that just muted there someone has to do it it was bound to be me um <laughs> so um so yeah i think i think that's something which has been been really challenging um it's quite difficult to find the balance point between um you know providing a, a good value for money for customers and ensuring that the the business model stacks up for the operator um and we that's something that we've um, we found quite challenging with the work that we did in Go Ultra Low Oxford. Um, I think going back, going over to what Ashley said, um, things that we're looking into are, are around variable rates, um, so that at times when people who don't have access to um, to a driveway might be charging up, which is probably likely to be mostly at night time, when you can get access to that lower cost energy, um, then we'd like to see rates coming down at those times um, for, for charging. I think one of the things that, that we're doing with Ox Gully is, is enabling people, uh, we hope, to access their home power supply. And so we think that's going to be something which would be really important to customers to be able to access that and to access the, um, you know, in combination with um, PV panels and uh, battery storage to be able to access power that they've generated at home and to charge up their vehicle as well. So um, that's another way of making things more equitable. Yep. Completely agree, and I suppose there kind of there's, there seems to be some new models on peer to peer as well, kind of community charging, yeah. the likes of co charger and others. So you could borrow your friend's charger, oh, sorry, neighbours or friends' charger, rather than um, uh, having to have a charger yourself. And increase the utilisation of the assets already out there. Um, Tom, any thoughts on on pricing? Yeah, it's, it's it's really difficult, and and Lizzie said earlier that there's not a panacea to this, and I think there's there's not a panacea to the, the prices as well. Um, a uh, charge point costs to install and it costs to connect to a network uh, a lot of time an awful lot of money um unless that's a funded proposition then it's very difficult to have a low price um and then the other side of it is uh, a local authority would tend to have a very um traditional energy tariff um for most of its assets um and that doesn't necessarily lend itself to time of use uh, or particularly low cost time of use. We, we kind of had the conversation with a an unnamed energy provider um, that said, uh, if we reduce your cost overnight, we'd increase your cost during the day. Simple as, and that's um, and that me that's quite difficult to to kind of um, to work through for an organisation. So um, yeah, big challenge and a big problem in the next five years, I think, to 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 make it a fair a fair system, definitely. Mm. Okay, fantastic. And I think it got mentioned a few times in the chat and in the questions around um, designated EV charging bays and the requirements around that. So I think there was a question, Lizzie, specifically for you in terms of the kind of gully solution, whether you would have designated EV charging bays for that household. Um, could you cover that off if that's okay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, the first thing I guess I'd say is that for powered EV charging solutions like like bollards that we're very much in support of having dedicated EV charging bays to make sure that um, those expensive assets um, get the best use that they can um, with the with the cable gullies our initial pilots didn't use reserve charging bays and we felt that it was um, it was something that would be very challenging to reserve an area of the public highway for someone to use an asset at their own property which isn't accessible to the general public uh, and so it's essentially privatizing an area of the highway, um, which we felt wasn't really in line with our uh, approach around reducing car ownership overall in general and, um, and being equitable. Um, so that's something that we want to continue with the pilot is to, is to go without um, 
and you know reserved parking bays. Some of the interesting things that we found were that um, when it came to um, users being able to access their 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 charging um, through a space outside their property, um, over time users learned um, how often they needed to charge. Um, so at first we saw people trying to use their chargers every day. Um, and having quite a lot of anxiety around being able to to plug in and charge and park outside their property. Over time, as they got used to their electric vehicles, they understood that they didn't need to park to, to charge every day, maybe once or twice a week. Um, so that reduced their anxiety. And we also found that particularly in areas where we had controlled parking zones, um, they were able to develop relationships with their neighbours and negotiate mm -hmm. with their neighbours really well around um, being able to, to move move cars and move into spaces. That was more challenging in areas where we had a lot of um, high turnover of population. So in student areas um, or places mm. where there were a lot of HMOs or where other people were coming in and parking because there was no control parking zone. But we still saw a degree of that happening. Um, and some of the residents who took part in the pilot um, made their own signs that they put on their front walls, um, asking oh. people to please leave that space free. Uh, so that was an interesting observation that they were able to do that. Um, it's not legally enforceable at all, but it's just a way of them being able to communicate with people around them that they need they need access to that space on a regular basis. So it was really interesting to see that people found a way through and were able to do that, were able to cope with it and were able to charge their cars up successfully. I think, um, sorry, just one more thing to say okay. on that, um, is that um, we think that that will work best when it's linked with good access to public EV chargers, uh, which do have reserve base, so that there's always a, a fallback. Fantastic. Okay, I think, I think we could have a whole session just on designated bays and, and on-street charging and all the kind of as issues around that. But I think we're over time now, so I'm afraid um, we're going to have to kind of uh, close close it down. We'll, we'll try and take as many questions that we haven't answered away and get some answers for you um, uh, as, as much as we possibly can. Um, so. Uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists and all the speakers um, for their time. That's uh, it's been a really useful session, I think. So, uh, and obviously thank everyone um, for tuning in. Um, so yeah, I think we've had kind of over 100, uh, 120 uh, all the way through, apart from the last last few minutes. So, um, the only final thing I'll mention um, is I think we've got one slide, Hannah. Can we just chuck that up on the screen? If not, then we can crack on. I think we'll we'll just crack on and end it there for, because we're slightly over time and we'll give uh, everyone a chance to get off and get a coffee and a, get a tea. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And we'll, set, we'll send uh, the slides out. Um, we'll send uh, as many of the links out as we've um, had throughout the session as well. So um, uh, I'll just once again thank everyone for their time and uh, thank you for all the speakers. So. Uh, Hopefully, um, see you all again soon. Thanks now.